Today we have Christian Lang, which will tell us about uh, who will tell us about orbifolds and systolic inequalities. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I want to start to talk about billiards as a motivation. And um, so if I have a Euclidean billiard for simplicity and I follow the usual reflection law, then this is uniquely defined uh, until I hit a corner. Um, so then you wonder what you can do. And um, yeah, so one way to resolve this is to say um, a, a pass is called a billiard trajectory if there exists a supporting hyperplane at this point, so that with respect to this hyperplane, um, the pass is a billiard trajectory with respect to the usual reflection law. Okay, and um, this uh, notion is meaningful in many respects. For instance, it has the property that limits of billiard trajectories are again billiard trajectories. And um, it is also a special notion of uh, the notion of the so-called quasi-geodesic in Alexandrov geometry. So what is that? Um, if you have a Riemannian manifold, then you know that there are geodesics starting in any direction. And um, now if you have a more general metric space like the boundary of a convex body, then geodesics may terminate at points. But there are so-called quasi-geodesics, which you can always extend. And um, yeah, so you define them in terms of some convexity property. And in Riemannian manifolds, for instance, they co always coincide with geodesics. Yeah, uh, and this notion also has um, some meaning in symplectic geometry because it is connected with uh, symplectic capacities. Uh, namely, you can relate the um, length of the shortest billiard trajectory with the symplectic capacity of the Lagrangian product of your billiard table with the um, unit ball of the, of the norm. And uh, then these minimal um, passes sometimes pass to uh, corners, like in this example here. Okay. Um, but uh, so, of course, there's now some ambiguity um, with this notion. And um, this leads to some discontinuity. So for instance, if I look at this example here <clears throat> and I hit the corner slightly to the left, then I go off uh, in this direction. On the other hand, uh, if I hit it slightly to the right, I go off in a completely different direction. So <clears throat> you can wonder um, when um, does this actually not happen? So when, um, are limits unique, or in other words, when do you have um, continuous billiard dynamics? <clears throat> um, okay, and it turns out that the condition for that to happen is that the angle uh, at some corner is um, pi divided by some natural number. So <clears throat> this is an easy exercise. Um, but you uh, you can show this by um, by looking at developments of your billiard tip. So instead of um, <laughs> one second. Um, yeah, so instead of looking at the re reflection, you um, you follow the billiard trajectory on the uh, reflected table. And if you do this uh, several times, then it's not so hard to uh, arrive at this condition. <clears throat> and now if you are in two dimensions, there are not so many uh, tables which satisfy this condition at every corner. In fact, these are all of them because uh, the sum of the angles has to sum up to pi. <clears throat> um, yeah, and the general statement is that <clears throat> if you have a polyhedral convex body, then it admits such a continuous billiard flow if and only if it is a so-called Riemannian orbifold. So this at least this is one way to phrase it. Um, yeah, so what is a Riemannian orbifold? Um, <clears throat> 
So uh, you can define it as a metric space, which has some local property, namely that every point has a neighborhood U, such that um, there's also some Riemann in manifold M and a finite group that acts by isometries on M so that the quotient space of M mod G is isometric to U enabled U. Um, yeah, so this definition has the advantage that you don't need to talk about changes of charts. Um, this is automatic in this definition because you can recover actually the action of G on M from the metric structure of this quotient if M is simply connected. Um, okay, and um, yeah, so in the examples that I've shown you before, the um, you actually have a global quotient, namely um, these uh, tables here, they are isometric to quotients of R2 model uh, discrete reflection group. And uh, the geodesic flow on R2 then gives rise to a continuous billiard uh, law on this quotient. Uh, and in general, if you have some um, Riemannian orbifold, which locally, oops, um, yeah, maybe looks like this. Um, and you have a curve that goes uh, through the singularity. Um, you say that it is a geodesic if you can lift it to a geodesic in a manifold chart. <clears throat> Okay, uh, now I want to relate this to the solid geometry. Um, so first of all, uh, if you look at this triangle, which you just saw in the list, and then this is the shortest billiard trajectory with three bounces. And um, now if I take two copies of this and uh, glue them together along the boundary, I get another Riemannian orbifold. And um, this is also known as the Calabi Crux here. Uh, and uh, by, by the way, if you have any questions, please uh, interrupt me. Um, I will be happy to answer them. So, um, yeah. And okay, and this uh, comes up in, in systolic geometry. So, what is that? Uh, let's say you have some um, Riemannian S2 here, and then you know that there's always a closed geodesic. And now you want to compare the lengths of the shortest closed geodesic with the um, area of the sphere. Um, and then it turns out uh, by a result of Krug that you can bound this length in terms of the area uh, by some constant. So the um, length squared is bounded by some constant times the area. And um, note that, um, for the round sphere, you get a pi, while for this Calabi Krug sphere, at least, um, so if you uh, approximate it by smooth metrics, or if you uh, view this as uh, in the obifold sense, um, you get a ratio which is strictly larger. And actually, this is conjectured to be the largest um, possible value. Um, and um, there are some partial results. For instance, um, Sabaro and Balanchev, they have shown that uh, this Calabi Crux sphere is uh, a local maximizer within some class of uh, metrics with conical singularities. Now, in this orbifold sense, uh, you can actually observe that you have a, that this metric is a global maximizer, at least if you look at metrics. Um, that uh, are defined on this orbifold with three conical singularities. And um, yeah, this um, is an um, uh, immediate corollary by Le Leuvner's theorem. So what is Leuvner's theorem again? Um, here I look at um, a Riemannian torus, two torus. And now I look not at the length of the shortest geodesic, but the length of the non the shortest non-contractable closed geodesic. And again, compared with the area, 
And then there's this sharp uh, inequality, which says that we have this bound with, in a, with equality if and only if the metric is uh, so-called equilateral torus. So uh, there you have a flat metric on the torus. <clears throat> now, um, so I would like to explain why this implies that uh, the kalabi crook metric is the global maximizer uh, among all default metrics. Um, for that, you um, can look at a covering. So this um, Kalabi Crooks here, or this uh, orbifold is covered by a torus. It's a threefold covering. And um, in particular, the area um, of the orbifold is uh, so three times the area of the orbifold is then the area of your torus. And you can also relate the length of the shortest uh, closed geodesic in the quotient with the uh, systole of the torus. So the systole is larger because the systole projects to a curve to a closed geodesic, which is shorter than the systole upstairs. And then of course the shortest geodesic downstairs is shorter than any other geodesic downstairs, uh, closed geodesic. So, and if you combine this, you get um, this observation here. Uh, okay, so this is one example of a systolic inequality on an orbifold. Um, we will see more later, but first um, I would like to uh, talk a bit more about uh, uh, the Mannion case, uh, the manifold case. Um, so at least there's something known about uh, local maximizers. Namely, if you have a Riemannian metric on S2, which uh, smooths and maximizes the systolic ratio, then uh, there has to be a closed uh, geodesic of minimal length to each point, because otherwise you could uh, perturb the metric. Um, so you could decrease the area without creating new systems. And um, actually, <coughs> Um, there are some local maximizers known, namely so called soil metrics. And um, yeah, so a soil metric is a metric all of whose <coughs> geodesics are closed and uh, have the same length. And uh, that they have the same length is actually automatic on S2. This is a result by Trommel and Vogel. Um, <coughs> and there are actually, there's an infinite dimensional space of such metrics. The first examples were constructed by Zoll in the uh, beginning of the 20th century. And then there are uh, non rotational symmetric examples by Gilliman. And actually, later, Lebrun and Mason described the modelized space completely, at least uh, locally, yeah, uh, locally around the round sphere. And yeah, this picture is due to Poitier, Conrad Poitier and his student Schmies. Um, <clears throat> okay, and yeah, the result says that any such soil metric is a local maximizer within, with respect to the C3 topology of metrics. Um, okay, and uh, in this uh, smaller class of rotational symmetric metrics, the same team of authors, Abondandolo, Pramham, Homi Venich, and Salamao, they uh, actually showed that these soil metrics are the, they are the maximizers and they are the only maximizers. And for all of them, the ratio um, equals pi. Um, okay, so um, I told you that the round metric is not a global maximizer of the systolic ratio, but uh, it has some chance to be a global maximizer if you look at other systolic ratios. For instance, if you uh, don't look at the shortest, uh, it's the length of the shortest non-trivial closed geodesic, but the length of the shortest non-trivial closed geodesic, which um, whose lift to the units bundle, a unit sphere bundle of your sphere is contractible. For instance, if you have a simple closed geodesic and you look at the lift to the unit tangent bundle, then it is never contractible. And um, if you look at this counter 
at this uh, Calabi Krug sphere, where um, um, you can actually, uh, so what you can do is instead of uh, looking at this geodesic, so uh, if you would lift this to the unit tangent bundle, then it would not be contractable. So you would have to uh, trans transverse it twice, but then you could uh, actually shrink it by going uh, first around this uh, side and then the other side. <clears throat> and yeah, um, for this new systolic ratio, actually no other examples are known which have a higher ratio. So one might conjecture that this is the optimum. The optimum. <clears throat> okay, and um, <clears throat> at least for rotational symmetric metrics, that's not so hard to confirm this. At least if one already uh, knows uh, this proof here by um, uh, um, that the soil metric are local maximizers for the usual historic ratio, you can adapt this proof to show that um, um, in the rotational symmetric case, although this contractible systolic ratio is a maximizer and the only maximizers. Yeah, so sorry, the soil metrics, uh, the soil metrics are the only maximizers. And yeah, so this result is actually, uh, so this is a joint work with Tobias Sult, but we prove this in a more general context, namely uh, we look at orbifolds and uh, <coughs> So now we look at orbifolds with two singularities. So topologically, it is a sphere, but um, you allow for two cyclic singularities. So two points of a neighborhood, which are quotients by usual, usual Riemannian disk by some finite cyclic group. In this uh, example here in the picture, there's actually only one. This is also fine. And, um, so this, um, this orbifold is different from the one we saw before in the sense that it is not covered by a manifold. In fact, um, orbifolds of this type are the only two orbifolds which are not covered by manifolds. Um, yeah, and we show that, um, um, yeah. we again look at this contractible systolic ratio and we would like, um, and we show that uh, the maximizers within the class of rotational symmetric metrics are precisely those metrics, all of whose um, geodesics are closed. Uh, could you please repeat uh, the word spindle? What does it mean? Um, yeah, so spindle uh, is my terminology for this type of orbifold. So you could. Is it a quotient of S3 by a locally free action of S1 with yes. weights M and N? Right, that's true. It's a quotient of S3 by a weighted Hopf action. I see. Okay, thank you. Um, and actually, this quotient construction also gives you examples of metrics all of whose geodesics are closed. Because if you look at uh, geodesics upstairs, which are orthogonal to the fibers, they project to close to the six in the quotient. And uh, actually, although uh, for these orbifolds, you have an infinite dimensional space of metrics, all of whose geodesics are closed. And uh, I should also mention that um, once you know that all geodesics are closed, then you can apply a theorem by Watsley which uh, tells you that there's a common period. So in this example, uh, you have the equator here, um, which has some period, and all the other prime geodesics are twice as long. So the green one here, um, if you approach the meridian, then you see that it cover covers it twice. Um, yeah. And mm -hmm. so yes. the this uh, systolic, uh, I should also say uh, um, that the units sphere bundle in this case, it's a length space. 
and uh, actually it's the lens base of this uh, T1. of this type. Um, yeah, and um, the this systolic ratio is designed in such a way that for the best metrics, the systole is carried by some uh, non-exceptional geodesic. So that, um, so if you would use the usual systolic ratio, then the systole would be carried by this meridian but then this would not be a, a, a local maximizer because you could perturb the metric away from the meridian um, and decrease the uh, the area while not creating new short dose geodesics. Um, yeah, so you can. There's another way of uh, phrasing this result with respect to some other systolic ratio, namely now uh, I pick some integer. K and I define LK to be the infimum of all lengths so that there are at least K closed geodesics which have lengths uh, not larger than L. So roughly speaking, this measures the length of the K's shortest geodesic. Uh, and here I'm not only counting prime geodesic but also iterates of geodesics. And uh, with respect to this, um, systolic ratio, you can prove a similar statement. So um, there is some k that de depends on the sum of m plus n and some constant c so that you have a sharp systolic inequality with equality if and only if the metric has all geodesics closed. Um, yeah. um, any questions? on that. Um, yeah, the proof of this statement is similar to the one by Abondandolo and his co-authors uh, in the sense that it uses uh, surfaces of section and generating functions. So the difficulty uh, is to uh, control how uh, so to control the topology or to see how the curves lift and um, yeah. Um, and I also want to mention that these metrics um, with all geodesics closed on these orbifolds are actually related to Finsler two spheres of constant fact curvature. So you know that there's only one Riemannian metric on S2 of constant curvature one, but within the class of Finsler metrics, there are tons of um, deformations that keep the constant, the curvature constant. And uh, there's some duality between these two objects. So you can um, from, um, you can go forth and back and translate questions um, to the other side. Okay, uh, yeah, here's another picture um, with more geodesics. Mm, okay, now I want to move to the contact geometry world. Um, let me remind you of some basic notions. Uh, so I consider a close contact to n minus one manifold um, with uh, one form lambda so that this contact condition is satisfied, lambda which d lambda to the n minus one is a volume form. And then you can compute the volume. And um, you also have the relate vector field, which is determined by this, these two conditions. And now you can define the context systolic ratio uh, as the uh, quotient of the, um, um, the minimal period of rape orbits to the power of n divided by the volume so that this becomes scale invariant. Um, and of course, this only makes sense if there is some closed rape orbit, but for instance, in dimension three, this is always the case by Taub's um, proof of the Weinstein conjecture. And um, yeah, examples. 
Of course, if you have the unit tangent bundle of a manifold, there you have the canonical Liouville form. And if you restrict it to the unit tangent bundle, this gives you an example where the geodesic flow coincides with the rep flow. But this construction also works for orbifolds. So if you have um, an orbifold with only isolated singularities, like uh, the like the examples that I've shown you on the last slide. Uh, there you have found the isolated singularities here and here. And in this case, the unit tangent bundle is a manifold. And um, you also have the canonical Liouville one form. And again, the geodesic flow coincides with the rep flow. And the volume of this three manifold, the contact volumes related to the volume of the orbifold. Uh, like in the manifold case. Mm. Okay, and now you uh, can ask the same question as before. What could be the maximizers or maybe local maximizers uh, of this ratio? And in some sense, this is uh, mm, nicer than in the Riemannian setting because of this observation by Alvarez Paiva and Roland Chef that any smooth local maximizer of the context historic ratio is actually Zoll. And yeah, meaning that all Judas, all the relief orbits are close and have the same period. Um, and this um, works by the same, yeah. So if this were not the case, then you would have some uh, orbit that doesn't close up. And now you could perturb uh, the contact form so that the contact volume becomes uh, smaller and without creating new uh, closed wave orbits so that the uh, ratio becomes larger. Um, yeah, and conversely, um, these contact uh, one forms are actually uh, local maximizers. And this is uh, uh, started by a paper by Alberto, Aham, Ronanimovic, and Salamao, who showed this for S3. Uh, so a soil contact form um, has some C3 neighborhood, so that any contact form in this neighborhood satisfies this inequality with equality if and only if it is also soil. Uh, yeah, so this was first shown for S3. Later, uh, Gabriele Benedetti and Yang Su Kang generalized it to three manifolds. And both of these proofs um, work by, they use the Calabi invariant on surfaces of sections. And um, later, Abel Dandolo and Benedetti generalized this to all dimensions by a different technique by a local normal form of such a soil contact one form. And as one uh, corollary, you get this, uh, a local sharp version of the Viterbo conjecture. Uh, so saying that there's some C3 neighborhood of the smooth ball in the space of smooth convex but, uh, bounded open subsets of R2n such that the um, minimal length of a closed characteristic on the boundary is bounded by the volume, uh, the contact volume. And yeah, so this um, minimal length coincides with the uh, instance uh, capacity. Actually, um, in the paper by Abandondolo and Benedetti, they um, show this statement, they show that this holds for any capacity, not only for this one. And you have uh, equality if and only if C is symplectomorphic to a ball. Um, okay, now, uh, like in the uh, orbifold case that we have looked at before, I want to define new uh, or other um, systolic ratios. Uh, namely, um, like in this orbifold case, I uh, want to look at 
is tau k and tau k is defined as the infimum over all periods so that there exists at least k closed tape orbits of a smaller period. So again, roughly speaking, this is the length of the case shortest, uh, the period of the case uh, shortest or closed tape orbit if uh, any exists. Um, and in a similar way as before, one can show that if you have a smooth local maximizer of this uh, higher systolic ratio, then it is it is not necessarily sol, but it is a best in the sense that uh, there exists um, a common period. So all uh, wave orbits are closed and they have a common period. Mm. Okay, now I give you some examples of where this condition is satisfied. So for instance, if you look at the standard Lewell one form on a CN and you restrict it to the boundary of a solid ellipsoid, uh, then or actually, and uh, you have here co-prime integers P1 up to T P N, then this actually has the property that all the orbits are closed. Uh, of course, if you have, um, you can also come from the Riemannian side. If you start with the Riemannian orbifold, all of whose geodesics are closed, and you look at the um, A flow on the unit tangent bundle, then this also gives you examples. Um, and actually, uh, Ostilovsky has shown that if you are in dimension at least five, then there are infinitely many pairwise non contactomorphic uh, best contact spheres. Okay. Um, yeah, so these uh, best manifolds, they have some nice properties. So, um, for instance, um, so I want to uh, state two characterizations in terms of the action spectrum. So the action spectrum is the set of all periods of uh, periodic tape orbits. Um, then Christofaro, Gardina, and Matsu, Marco Mazzucchelli, they have shown that if you have a contact, a close contact manifold, and okay, I'm always assuming connected, then this is best if and only if the action spectrum is um, arithmetic sequence. Um, yeah, this is one uh, property. And um, there's also a characterization in terms of uh, action selectors. So if you have a convex contact sphere, so a, con a convex uh, body in CN plus one, then again, you can restrict the standard Lewy one form to uh, get a contact form on the boundary. And uh, there are some action selectors uh, by defined by Eklund and Hofer in terms of uh, some min-max procedure. So this gives you an increasing sequence of uh, elements in the action spectrum. And um, Ginsburg, Vey, and Matukeli, they have shown that this contact manifold is best if and only if um, there are um, n plus one, if, if you have um, n plus one, sorry, uh, yeah, if there are, if n plus one consequent uh, elements in the sequence coincide. Um, okay. Um, yeah, now I want to talk about uh, general construction related to these uh, best manifolds, um, which uh, corresponds to the, so if you have a, this is uh, like the so-called plus P1 construction for soil manifolds. Um, so if I have such a best contact manifold, then the rate flow induces an almost free action. So the stabilizer groups are finite and the quotient is an orbifold. Um, and um, so you can view this as an S1 orbi bundle. Um, and this gives rise 
uh, this portion that gives rise to a syntactic form on the quotient, which is actually integral. Um, namely, um, it is related to the Euler class of the uh, Orbi bundle. Um, and the yeah, syntactic form on the quotient and the contact form uh, upstairs, they are related by this relation here, where TMC is the minimal common period. Um, yeah, and this so far, this is the same story as in the manifold case. Then now one can additionally observe that the Euler class induces isomorphisms. Um, okay, this is also true in the Sol case, but we will later see why this has uh, some meaning. Um, so if you look at the Gaussian sequence, then you know that above the dimension of M, the cohomology groups of M vanish. And uh, if you plug this into the Gaussian sequence, then you get that these maps are isomorphisms for all i uh, at least to n minus one. So for all i larger than the dimension of n. Um, yeah, and yeah, this is actually a special case of uh, uh, syntactic reduction. So you can, um, I mean, this quotient uh, construction here, um, you can, if you simplex, look at the syntactization of M, you cross it with R plus and uh, define a symplectic form. Then you can extend the S1 action to this product and look at the Hamiltonian, which does just projects through the second factor. And then this gives you a, uh, then you can, can apply symplectic reduction and you get exactly this symplectic manifold. And yeah, in general, symplectic reductions give rise to symplectic orbifolds. So, uh, I'm saying this because uh, so sometimes it is uh, nice to know when an orbifold is actually a manifold. For instance, if you uh, if you want to have a converse of this construction, so you start with a symplectic manifold with some integral symplectic form, and you would like to construct the best contact manifold, then in general you only get a best um, contact orbifold. And uh, now I want to explain when this construction actually, actually gives a manifold. And for that, I want to recall some notions about orbifold cohomology. So um, if you have any orbifold, then you can always realize it as the quotient of some uh, manifold by, a, by the action of a compact Lie group, uh, by an almost free action of a compact Lie group. So for instance, uh, if you define a metric on your orbifold, then you can look at the unit and at the orthonormal frame bundle. And then you have the author, orthonormal group acting on this and the quotient is exactly the orbifold you started with. And now you can define um, uh, orbifold cohomology groups as the um, equivariant cohomology groups of this group action. And the nice thing about this is that it actually is independent of the representation of your orbifold, which you choose, which is of course not unique. Yeah, for instance, if you have a weighted projective space, you can write it as a quotient of Sn by um, under the under S1 action. But you uh, can also look at the orthonormal frame bundle, which gives you another representation. Um, okay, and now if you take a small chunk of your orbifold, then um, this cohomology is actually always infinite dimensional. So uh, let's say at least if the uh, this group here is non-trivial, um, because then um, for such a small piece uh, with uh, singularities, the cohomology coincides with the group cohomology, which is always infinite dimensional. And now there is some nice characterization of when an orbifold is a manifold in terms of this cohomology, which is due to Quillen. And it says that your orbifold is a manifold if and only if all these cohomology groups are trivial above the top dimension. So this uh, somehow says that 
Um, there is can no be uh, no miraculous cancellation uh, in the Maya V Taurus sequence. If you uh, uh, if you uh, divide your orifold into many small pieces, all of which have infinite dimensional cohomology. Okay, and now I look at some applications of this. Uh, so we have seen all folds, all of whose geodesics are closed. And one can use this character revelation to show that they can um, exist only in even dimensions, at least if you want them to be simply connected uh, as all folds. So uh, another way of phrasing this is that if you have an all fold, all of whose geodesics are closed and the dimension is odd, then it is covered by a manifold. Um, yeah, sometimes it is easier to uh, get a hand on the homotopy groups. And we have also some um, conditions in terms of the homotopy groups um, together with Marco Radeski. And for instance, we can show that a compact to n minus two connected to n orbifold is always a manifold if n is at least three. Um, so this type of theorem can, for instance, be applied or in the classification of foliations. Um, yeah, but this result is not sharp. So um, the uh, the opti um, so the only examples. Um, if you want to construct highly connected orbifolds, there are only examples where the um, homotopy groups up to half of the dimension of the orbifolds, of the orbifold bench roughly. Uh, so there's some room for improvements here. Um, okay, so back to this uh, Bruce B. Gun construction. Now, if I start with my symplectic orbifold, uh, with some integral symplectic form, I can um, I want to construct a best manifold now, and uh, first I um, impose an additional condition, namely that the Euler class induces isomorphisms um, by the so the cup product with the Euler class induces isomorphisms in all dimensions above the dimension of the orbifold. Then um, one um, yeah, can uh, reverse this Bruce B. Van construction and get a contact a manifold, which is actually a manifold by this condition together with the Guzing sequence and the characterization back then. And this tells you that the cohomology of the total space is finite dimensional, and hence it is a manifold. Um, so and the other conclusions are like uh, in the usual Bruce B. Van construction. In particular, uh, now I want to focus on uh, dimension three. In dimension three, one can show that any uh, cipher vibration on an orientable three manifold um, whose Euler class. Um, pairs with the class of the base, uh, if this pairing is negative, so the Euler number is negative, then the Seifert vibration uh, uh, yeah, can be realized as, an, uh, as such a rape flow, all of whose rape orbits are closed. Um, yeah, so the only examples where this uh, is not possible are examples in which the Euler class Okay, let's say up to orientation, the only cases where this is not realizable by a best rate flow is when the Euler class vanishes. And this is uh, precisely the case when your bundle is covered by a trivial bundle. And for a trivial bundle, you cannot have a contact form which induces this as one action because then you would have a symplectic uh, you would have a closed symplectic form on a surface, which is not possible. Okay, so in dimension three, you have many examples. 
And now I would like to characterize, explain a characterization of these examples in terms of uh, the higher systolic in, uh, ratios that I told you before. Mm. So I start with a, a closed best contact free manifold. And then I first recall the definition of these higher inequalities, the higher systolic ratios. So this tau k was defined as the infimum of all periods so that there is a close wave orbits of periods at most t. Um, yeah, and in this case, so dimension three is special in the sense that if you have a best contact, a best flow, then there are only finitely many singular wave orbits, uh, which um, have a period which is shorter than the common minimal period. And I call them gamma one up to gamma h. And they have some multiplicities, alpha one up to alpha h. Um, and now I want, would like to count all the um, singular rib orbits, which are below the common minimal period. So for instance, this uh, gamma one, I can iterate alpha one minus one times, and the next iteration then gives, you, gives me the common minimal period. So if I count this all together, I get this number here. And um, yeah. And now at this k naught, the sequence of um, tau i's actually stabilizes because at this value, you arrive at the common minimal period where you have infinitely many rape orbits of the same period so that the sequence stabilizes. Um, okay, and now I can state the result, uh, which I proved with Alberto and Marco. Uh, so it has two directions. The first one says that if you have a close connected orientable manifold, three manifold and some positive integer k, um, and you have some contact form on this uh, manifold, which is a local maximizer of rho k, then uh, this uh, contact form is best, as I uh, explained before, but in addition, the k is also given by this um, k naught, which was determined by the multiplicities. So, um, for instance, if you have a Zoll in the Zoll case, this means that um, rho two is not a local maximizer of a Zoll um, contact manifold, for instance. Um, yeah, and we also prove a converse direction, which says that um, every best contact form on Y, which satisfies this uh, condition, so that K is precisely given by this K naught determined by the multiplicities, then there exists some C3 neighborhood, so that each contact form in this neighborhood, uh, for each contact form, you have this inequality on the K um, systolic ratios again, and you have equality if and only if the contact form is best. Mm, yeah, so this has corollaries. For instance, it gives you also uh, local systolic inequalities on the best orbifolds, uh, which I've which we have seen before, and also for um, Finsler two spheres. There are these there are these Finsler matrix on S2, all of whose Judas 6 are closed. And they also give rise to these contact forms, to best contact forms. Uh, yeah, then two more remarks. Namely, uh, first, uh, these row Ks, they are bounded from below by row one. And row one uh, has been shown to be unbounded by um, Sakla, um, e even if you only look at contact forms in the given for a given that induce a given contact structure on your manifold. Uh, on the other hand, um, these systolic ratios are bounded 
um, by something proportional to rho one. If you look at um, boundaries of smooth convex bodies in CN, because uh, their uh, rho one is universally bounded. Um, yeah. Okay, then uh, I give you some examples. Uh, so again, this ellipsoids, which we have looked at before um, in dimension four. So uh, it's a three manifold, the boundary. And in this case, there are uh, P. Uh, so there's one exceptional orbit of minimal period P, another one of minimal period Q, and all the others have minimal period P times Q. So that um, this k zero is given by p plus q minus one, and um, the volume can easily be computed to be p times q. So that this ratio is given by p times q. Um, yeah. Now I say something about the uh, proof, uh, at least if there are. No questions about the statement. Mm, okay. Um, so the proof, um, like in the case, uh, in the many in the salt case, uses uh, sur global surfaces of sections. So let me let me remind you uh, this notion about this notion. So if I have a contact three manifold, I say um, a smooth map from some surface sigma to Y, um, some oriented connected compact surface with non-empty boundary is called a global surface of section. If um, at least we define it in that way, if um, the restriction to the boundary is an immersion, which has the same orientation um, yeah, so it's an immersion and it's tangent to the rib orbits. Yeah, it coincides with the rib orbit. And the orientation should be compatible. And then in the interior, it is an embedding and it is transverse to the rib vector field. And then there's this globality condition that if you start at any point in the manifold, you intersect your um, surface of section in both negative and positive time. Um, yeah, so now I sketch, uh, maybe you have seen this before, how um, the proof roughly goes uh, for S3. So the strategy here is to uh, spy contradiction. So you suppose that you have a contact form. Uh, you have contact forms lambda arbitrarily close to a soil contact form, which violate the systolic inequality. Then um, you can find a surface of section for these um, nearby uh, contact forms um, that bound um, a minimal rib orbit of these nearby contact forms. And um, yeah, you you uh, so so you do this in such a way that. Uh, you have this lambda, and now you pick the rib orbit of lambda with minimal period, and you um, construct the surface of section that bounds precisely this um, rib orbit of minimal period of lambda. And then you can arrange that the so if if um, lambda is sufficiently close to lambda zero, you can arrange that the first return map is close to the identity. Uh, so it has to be C1 close to the identity. Um, yeah, and then there's a fixed point theorem, which um, tells you, you can apply and see that this map has actually some fixed point with a, that corresponds to a period which is smaller than the minimal period, which gives you a contradiction. Um, now, I would like to uh, explain you why this strategy doesn't work in the best case. Um, so the problem is that if you um, 
<laughs> if you have your contact forms lambda, which are close to lambda one, and the minimal uh, wave orbit of lambda um, bifurcates from, one, on the one hand, bifurcates from the regular orbit, but on the other hand, uh, converges to the singular orbit of lambda zero. If um, lambda becomes closer to lambda zero, then the topology of your surface of section jumps. It is, uh, there's some discontinuity. Um, and there, therefore it is not, uh, it's problematic to control that um, the first return map is close to the identity. Uh, yeah, and I want to illustrate this with an example. So if you have this uh, E23 ellipsoid and um, you look at an orbit, at a singular orbit, and you want to construct a surface of section that bounds a singular orbit. So for example, in this case, um, the singular orbit of period three, then this um, surface of section gives you an orbifold covering of this disk here. And so it has to be a disk. On the other hand, if you uh, take a regular orbit, then uh, your surface of section covers this orbifold. And um, yeah, but this is a hyperbolic. So any cover of this, any manifold cover of this is a surface of higher genus. So it's not compatible with the disk. Um, yeah, so there we have to follow some other strategy. And what we do uh, is um, we first prove uh, such a result here, which says that if I have such a best flow and I have any rape orbit, then we can find a global of surface of section that um, um, whose boundary maps to this given rape orbit. So the boundary may have several components, but all of them are mapped to the same uh, rape orbit gamma. Um, and we have explicit control on the topology of the surface of section. And this is also necessary for the proof. Mm. And then um, we can apply a stronger uh, fixed point theorem. Um, so uh, that also works if the bounding orbit is not minimal. And uh, in order, in yeah, so. We are only able to apply this because, so it is crucial that uh, all the um, orbits here, that all the boundary components map to the same orbit, because this, uh, in the proof, this gives us that um, the first return map actually has a zero flux. And uh, yeah, so, um, so in the proof, we show that the first return map is uh, Hamiltonian. And uh, this condition here says that the average of the generating uh, Hamiltonian on every boundary, boundary component is the same. And this is uh, necessary in the proof of this. Uh, this is an assumption which is required for the fixed point theorem that we apply. OK, uh, so I think uh, my time is up. Uh, I thank you for your attention and uh, happy to answer questions if you have some. Yes, I think Shira had to, to run, so uh, I'm replacing her somehow. Uh, so, are there any questions? I think Marco, you're speaking, but I, but you're muted. No, maybe not. No, maybe not. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I was wondering, do you have this uh, this uh, specific result um, uh, uh, for some classes of uh, or B-folds, uh, mm -hmm. Riemannian or B-folds, I mean? And mm -hmm. I was wondering uh, whether it was possible to, to hope for something general, more general, or uh, is it out of reach? Or? Um, so, 
what one could try to do uh, or what is not known yet if you have any two or default and it is not known if it satisfies uh, systolic inequality like what well, you look at a two sphere um, which with some singularities and then it is not known if uh, uh, results like the one by Krug holds but I think this is something one could do uh, and this is not you cannot uh, you do not get this immediately as a corollary um, for instance, what you could try to do is to um, approximate your orbifold metric by smooth metrics and then apply the Krug theorem, but this doesn't work because in this approximation process, you completely lose the control of the geodesics that go close to a singular point. Hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, I have another question. In fact, these uh, these last results. Uh, I mean, I, I think for in the case k equals one, you had uh, some relation with the uh, capacities. I forgot exactly what it was, but uh, and um, so I was wondering whether uh, in the for higher case mm -hmm. uh, you would also have some relation, something to say about capacities. Uh, yeah. So um, this uh, one, uh, let's say. Yeah, this is just, let's say you are on a boundary of a convex body in uh, CN, then uh, uh, the one is exactly the capacity ratio. Or let's say, mm -hmm. oops, uh, tau one is exactly the minimal period, which is the capacity. And you can relate the other um, taus, uh, they, uh, they are at least bounded by the higher capacities because um yeah so the capacities they lie in the action spectrum and they are uh, um, in, in increasing sequence and um so if you would have um two um if you would have that k is the same as k plus one, then there would be infinitely many. Um, then one could use a list and extreme theorem to uh, say that there are infinitely many closed Weber orbits at this uh, level, at this action level. Um, and yeah, if um, then the, the task would stabilize at this level. So in general, you have this inequality. But it is not so clear what the um, global maximizers would be. Okay, thank you. Um, are there more uh, questions or comments? Yeah, maybe a related question. Yeah, something that probably I should know, but then I forgot. Uh, was there then some uh, natural guess of what would be the analog of uh, Viterbo conjecture for these higher capacities? Um... Or yeah. Um, not. So, at least um, if you look at um, um, convex toric domains in C2, so what is that? Um, you have some uh, concave function, and then you look at this uh, so called convex toric domain. The, which, uh, for instance, um, uh, encompasses um, ellipsoids and polar disks. And um, so here one can show, if you uh, look at, um, so for these uh, convex torix domains, you can compute explicit, their explicit formulas for the um, 
uh, higher capacities defined in terms of S1 equivalent homology. And um, here you can check within this class of convex bodies um, that for K equal to two, the maximizers are the E2A comma A ellipsoid and the polar disk, while for any larger K, the polar disk is the unique maximizer. Okay, so the conjecture would be that maybe maybe this is always the case. Uh, yeah, okay. yes. Uh, or convex, say. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Some other questions? Okay, that's good. And I guess we can thank Christian again. Thank you very much. <laughs>